Hi, I'm Steve Van Meter, Macro Fund Manager and Inventor of Portfolio Shield, and I'm here today with the president of Real Vision, Travis Kimmel. Travis, thanks for joining me today. Great to be here, Steve. So Travis and I, we talk about macro pretty much every day, and Travis has a deep view in the macro world. He's got a great framework, and I wanted to get him on to talk about some of these subjects because he's not afraid of the controversial ones. But before we do that, I want to bring Travis's background into the picture here because a lot of us don't know where he came from. So Travis, can you tell us kind of what you were doing before you became the president of Real Vision? Yeah. So back in the day, I uh, I graduated with a philosophy degree and uh, upon graduation, I realized the philosophy plant wasn't hiring. So I had to figure out a way to make money in the real world and stumbled into uh, software development, ended up going down that path, was a developer for a few years, um, got into the, the management side of of software engineering and quickly noticed that the tooling around how um, software engineering is managed is, is just really kind of in the dark ages. Um, so a friend of mine and I formed a company called Git Prime uh, back in, I think it was 2015-ish, and um, built out a platform that plugs into sort of Git and version control, all these tools that software developers use to help give a better view of what's happening down in the trenches. And uh, was the CEO of that for four and a half years and we ended up selling the company, did about a year of, of integration work and then came over to Real Vision. Well, that's really cool. So, but before this, you were kind of semi-retired, at least how you and I kind of met and starting to get to know each other. And then for those who've been uh, Real Vision subscribers for a long time, there's one of two ways that you find out Real Vision is hiring. One, you log in and Milton tells you there's there's potential job openings. Or number two, uh, you're on Twitter and either Raul or you know, the production team is is flying a job. But with you, we didn't see that. Just out of nowhere, Raul announces on Twitter, we have a new president and it's Travis. So I, I think, can you tell us a little bit about how that happened? Sure. I had initially reached out to Raul just to say thanks. I mean, I'm, I'm a big fan of the the platform had been a subscriber for a while and was trying to decipher the world of, of economics I found out that I had had some sort of misconceptions about that. Um, and then found real vision and dug in and was watching at one point, I, you know, initially I was watching like three to four hours of videos a day. I just got totally obsessed with it. Um, so I'd reached out to Raul to say, thanks for, for making a great product. We connected, um, started chatting for a while. And then, um, after a bit, we started collaborating just kind of lightly on some some ideas around how to build out, you know, additional software and features that, that he had an eye on. And then uh, we were talking on, on one meeting. He's like, hey, what do you think about coming over and, you know, being president? I, I thought he was joking. So I just sort of laughed. I'm like, yeah, cool. That, that sounds great. And then he hit me up after the call. He's like, seriously, what would it take? So, um, so yeah, I mean, I you know sort of stumbled into it, but I'm really glad to be here. It's an awesome crew. Well, I know on behalf of the subscribers and everyone else, we're excited to have you here. Can you, you know, share with us maybe some of the ideas that you have? Uh, in, I know you've only been president for a short while now, but maybe some of those ideas you have uh, for the Real Vision platform? Yeah, we're really um, attentive to a lot of the requests that we see coming in, some of which are, you know, I think people have the experience that there is, there's a lot there and that, um, fleshing out the UI so it's a little easier to navigate, being able to follow a theme through the platform. I think the first layer of what we'll do is um, thinking about how we package all this content up so that people can track the things that they're interested in a little more specificity. Um, there will be a lot of other, you know, nice to have upgrades, kind of overall maturation of the software platform, and then some super top secret stuff down the line. Hi, I'm Ralph Powell. Sorry to interrupt your video, I know it's a pain in the ass, but look, I want to tell you something important. Is I can tell that you really want to learn about what's going on in financial markets and understand the global economy in these complicated times. That's what we do at Real Vision. So this YouTube channel is a small fraction of what we actually do. You should really come over to realvision.com and see the 20 or so videos a week that we produce of this kind of quality of content, the deep analysis and understanding of the world around us. So if you click on the link below or go to realvision.com, it costs you one dollar. I don't think you can afford to be without it. A little more specificity. Um, there will be a lot of other, you know, nice to have upgrades, kind of overall maturation of the software platform, and then some super top secret stuff down the line.
Well, cool. Well, well, we'll definitely be looking forward to, you know, a, a smoother UI. And, and I know I, I, when I log in, I would love to have it where, you know, some of the themes that I follow, they would just alert me. And I think that's great. And of course, yeah. we all love top secret stuff. So we can't wait to hear uh, what you've got coming down the pipeline for us. Yeah, more later this year. It's going to be great. Awesome. Well, last week you were on with Ed Harrison and the Daily Brief, and you touched on a little bit of your your macro framework. And I know as an executive now, Real Vision is probably in the in the guidebook that you're required to have a macro framework to work there. Um, but for those who missed that, can you kind of take us through you know what your macro framework is and how you how you created it? You know, I'm I'm relatively uh, junior in thinking about macro. I would say just from a time perspective since I had largely been focused on software and other stuff for, for the bulk of my career. And so the thing that I tend to favor is looking at a bunch of big thinkers in the space, kind of pushing against, you know, thinking about how I would argue against that thesis. So, you know, I'm, I'm largely a, 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 maybe not a contrarian, but just a contrary person. <laughs> and so every time I hear a view expressed, I'm like, well, what would be the best way to go kind of knock that view around? I do that a little bit um, either in my head, sometimes on Twitter, just kind of engage on there, prod at it a little bit. And then every time there is a, a, a piece of a large macro framework that I like, sort of take that, set it aside, do that with a bunch of the thinkers in the space, and then try to build up a view of all of the pieces of that that I think are the most solid into something that's a little bit more my own. So, you know, I've pulled from, as you know, people like you, people like Brent, um, Raul's uh, framework around the, you know, liquidity and then the hope phase and insolvency. I mean, there's a lot of really good components out there. So I like to sort of see how many of those I can synthesize into a view um, that's my own. Yeah. And that's really cool because you didn't become a subscriber of Real Vision to be the president. That was probably never in, in your plan. And so you, no. you've gone what I'll call the buffet route of macro is you, you've gone down that's the right. line and said, wow, I like a little bit of this, a little bit of that. And you've kind of constructed your whole view, and which is great because Real Vision, you don't have to build your own view. You can go take pieces from some of the, the top thinkers and then kind of adopt their view. Yeah. All right. So I know you're on the deflation side of this, but but let's rehash that a little bit again for the yeah. people who missed the daily brief is there's two really strong sides to macro right now. Either you believe uh, the coronavirus caused the economic downturn. You believe the Fed is printing money. Inflation is coming and you, you better get in now because you're, you're going to get run over or you're you know, being that you're a, 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 a tend to lean to the minority side on this stuff. Anyways, you're on the deflation camp. You don't believe the Fed is printing money. You believe that their acts are going to cause deflation. And we're going to see in that insolvency event or deflationary crash before that. So kind of take us through where you're at in that so we can dig deeper into your views. I really enjoy studying the monetary plumbing. Um, I think it's fascinating stuff, super complex. And I tend to be on the deflation side. Um, I think the way that I arrived there is... Um, a reaction to that idea that you better get in now. Anytime someone, you know, comes to you and says you better, I'm like, really? Well, what happens if you don't? Like what, you know, what's, the, again, what is the counter case here? And um, I think I, I actually probably started 2020 from a positioning perspective um, as, as a sort of mild inflationist. And, you know, thinking that we could see, um, thinking that we could see some stimulus. I hadn't really dug into what stimulus meant yet. Um, and was positioned largely for um, sort of mild inflationary stuff. And then in the, the liquidity event that happened in 08 caused me to dig in a little bit deeper and figure out, you know, when the Fed starts ramping up QE, why does it affect markets that way? And, and what's really going on here? And so my, my general view is that there is the potential for QE to make certain types of prices go up. And the way that I think of that is you've got a bunch of you know, money exists forward through time on this curve, and people use that curve to de-risk all sorts of business and sovereign state activity. And when there's a liquidity crisis, what the Fed basically does is liberate a bunch of that money that's been imprisoned for the future into the now. So you get this, you do get a flush of future money being brought into now money. And as a result, that now money has to figure out where to go. And, and you can see, you know, you never really know where it's going to go. I think that's actually quite hard to predict, but the equity markets are big and liquid. So some of it goes there, it gets kind of splashed around a bit. Um, but when you pop the hood on the economy and you start thinking about what's really going on um, structurally, you know, 
there is a lot of damage. I mean, you walk around in whatever town you're in, we're in a relatively small town, and there are businesses that have been around for a while that are just gone. People's revenue streams are gone. Um, you know, the way that they would service the debt they have is gone. Most Americans have some non-trivial amount of debt. You know, we, as a society, we've sort of um, normalized buying real estate on margin, which I think is kind of wild. Like we never, we never think about it because it's been normalized. But if if your friend went to you and said, hey, I just took out a $500,000 loan and I bought SPY, you'd sort of look at that and think like, that's, that's a little risky, you know, like this. I don't know. I don't know if that's a great idea. It w- you know, there are times when it would be, there are times that it wouldn't, but it's a, it's a serious amount of risk. And yet everyone does that as standard operating procedure with houses. And so there's this normalization of debt as how we get access to things, whether it's kind of consumer debt or, or you know, large purchase debt. And when you get this sort of destruction wave that goes through the economy, what that does is it creates the supply and demand imbalance because debt is demand for dollars. It's, you know, it's this constant pressure to find dollars so you can service your own debt. And, um, and, and when people lose access to their dollar generating engines, whether that's their job or their business, you get a supply and demand imbalance that favors more pressure on the dollar. Now, the, the, the feds and um, you know, policy measures got pretty creative this time in punting that. <laughs> I think we saw some some very creative stuff that we hadn't seen before. The combination of the forbearance, yeah, you know, a lot of it was genuinely trying to help people through a really weird time. But um, the effect that that had was a temporary reduction in that demand impulse. The normally we would have expected to cause this, you know, cascade of damage. I think a lot of people tried to short the market, and that didn't really work out because this this demand had been punted into the future. And so as we as we think about what's going on in the economy now, that pain still has to come. Like those debts still need to be serviced. That's gonna, it's gonna turn back on at some point. And people are gonna need to go find dollars. They're gonna need to figure out how to rebuild their own economic engine. I expect we see a nice little wave of entrepreneurship from this, but you know, having grown a business, it takes time to turn it into a money machine. Yeah, and, and and one thing I like about you, because you come from a software background, and you don't know this about me, but I used to be in IT before I got in this industry, and uh, I was on more on the engineering side, plug a cable in, in each end, and, and either lights go on and, or the connection, or it doesn't. <laughs> you on the software side, right? Either the code works or it doesn't. Yeah. And, and that that same understanding of, of our you know IT world that you and I had, as we, as we look at the monetary system, uh, we didn't take the, well, QE just does this because everyone says it did. You and I wanted to pop the hood, pull the engine out, rip it apart and be like, does it really work this way? Yeah. And, you know, and when you finally get how QE works, it totally changes your perspective, except for the fact that it causes this irrational exuberance, as you kind of mentioned in, yep. in the equity markets, because people's perception of what it is and what it does are very different. So you, you mentioned the economy being pretty weak, but a lot of people now, you know, look at this blue wave. We've got a Democratic president, split uh, Senate, slight majority in the House, potential massive amounts of stimulus coming. The market almost seems to think that people on unemployment is great because the government can backfill all that demand and take us right out of this. Is that do you see that as a possibility or do you still think this insolvency event is going to happen? I still think the insolvency event happens. There's a couple dimensions to that. One, you know, from a human behavior perspective, if you've ever, if you've ever been kind of back against the wall financially, whether you're getting, I don't know, you're getting, you know, you're young and you're unemployed, you're getting handouts from your parents or whatever, whatever the variant of not controlling your own destiny economically looks like, which is effectively what happens with these stimulus checks. You know, we're just helping people out. It's aid. It's not really stimulus. It's just aid. And right. And people who are who are receiving aid, which I have in my life, as many of us have, you know, I I got like a ten thousand dollar loan from my dad at one point. You know, it changes your behavior. You're not going out and buying new cars. You're not, you know, you're, you're sort of on the back foot. So I think even if we were, if we imagine a world in which this stimulus becomes perpetual, it's just like walk that out. You know, we're, there's a bunch of unemployed people, and we just decide to pay them forever. Is that really inflationary? And I'm not sure. I think people have this tendency to focus on the on the fact um, that people are receiving actual checks. For some reason, people hear about the government sending a physical check. It like blows their mind, you know. Um, and, and that's funny. It, it seems not super relevant. I mean, the government does transfer payments to people directly all the time. 
We call those salaries for government employees. Like it's not even a weird thing. And so what happened is that the government just upped the payroll a little bit. You know, they're paying a few more people. But I don't think that um, the recipients of that are going to be incentivized to go out and aggressively spend. And if they're not incentivized to go out and aggressively spend, that cycles back into this aggregate money supply because they're not taking on new debt, right? You're not going to initiate new liabilities for yourself if you don't think you can pay them off. Well, yeah, and you can't really go to a bank and, and apply for a loan when they say, Who, who's your employer? So, well, the, right. the state of the state. or the federal <laughs> yes. government, right? I mean, that, that yes. doesn't work. And, you know, because we we did see, you know, some inflationary pressure, you know, when, when COVID first hit, because people thought that these one-time transfers, you know, were just a short-term or a long, a short-term vacation. And we're all going back to work with more money that obviously is not happening. Uh, but when you talk about transfers, I mean, we, we already have unemployment, you know, in across all the states. And here's a controversial topic. How about social security? Because, you know, I, I do understand it's, it's funded until about 2033, but after that, it's not, that is a form of government transfer that people are on and it's not inflationary. I mean, that is giving people money. So, you know, I, I was talking to a client of mine yesterday, he owned several rental property. And when we're talking about this insolvency event, he says, well, uh, last year, all my tenants were at 25% of their rent. And he, I asked him, why is that? He's like, because that's all they would pay. Yeah. And he goes, I started calling all of them this month saying, here's the deal. Either you start paying full rent starting January 1, or I'm I'm either going to kick you out or I'm going to sell the property out from underneath you. And that got me thinking, ooh, this, that demand potentially that we saw last year in terms from the consumer may be going away as they're now forced to take care of their normal bills and then potentially property owners may find themselves in default besides the fact that prices are going crazy. Totally. Yeah. So I think that's going to be really uh, interesting to watch play out. You know, there's a fair amount of that going on. Um, I think a lot of uh, property owners looked at the situation and said, this is going to hit everyone pretty hard. Um, and it's probably better if we spread it out a little bit. So we'll take a hit as well. You know, we're, we're not going to grind people. Um so they would work with them and say, "Look, pay pay what you pay what you can. What can you pay? I'd rather have someone in here and have non-zero revenue coming in than just have the thing be vacant. But if you've levered up, you can only withstand that for so long because the bank wants their cut too. So I think we're getting to an interesting point here where you know the vaccine's starting to vaccine's starting to get distributed. My parents both got it, which is awesome." Um, that that's going to be a, a slow rollout, but as the good news hits, people are going to want to start to get paid, and I think that that is definitely underpriced. Like people look at the vaccine rollout and they think now we're going to get into the really bullish time, but when things get better is also when all of this forbearance stuff ends, because it has to at some point. Yeah, and and one thing I I hear is. Well, we'll look at the money supply, which, you know, when, when yeah. I think when you're new to macro, the money su supply is like, oh, and you're yeah. like, this explains everything. And then as you really start to dig deeper, you realize, especially if you talk to Jeff Schneider or, or listen to him enough, you, you realize it maybe isn't what you think it is at all. But there's this perception that there's all these people that have just tons of money. And then yet you read uh, pieces from David Rosenberg, which was in uh, repeated in Dr. Lacey Hunt's core report that I know you read. This says, look, a lot of people are delinquent or not even paying their bills since March. And kind of like my client has said, look, I, I put my property in forbearance, but that isn't going on forever. I still got property tax pay and other maintenance. Yeah. you got to start paying. And I don't think the stock market and the broad economy realizes that there is a point where all these people are going to have to start paying again. And that is not bullish at all for the, the economy. That's right. Because, you know, you're going to start you're going to start seeing some of the spend that um, that has been kind of you know decent for, for a covid lockdown have to go toward these more essential line items like rent is a pretty essential line item. And and, you know, there's there's you know, if you have debt that's been deferred, that becomes a pretty essential line item. And anybody who who can't service that stuff, you get two effects from that. One, you're going to transfer a bunch of spending into paying down debt, which is is net dollar destructive, right? When you pay down debt, it's the uncreation of dollars. So you're going to see a bunch of that come online. And then in addition to that, you're going to see a lot of this pull forward demand, you know, people buying exercise bikes or whatever, that stuff is largely rolled off. Like you, you're not going to buy another exercise bike next year. 
And you're going to be a little more focused on hustling and getting back to some semblance of solvency. If you're, especially if you're in a small business or if you've lost your job. And I, I think that um, forces people to focus on stuff that's a little more basic. And you can, you could see some of this, uh, re, these retail numbers, which had been pretty decent for a while, start to roll over. I think we're starting to see that. Yeah, we, yeah, we definitely are. And uh, I want to come back to this r- real estate topic because I actually think that we could see uh, a crash in real estate prices, just like the great financial crisis. And uh, subscribers will know that I interviewed Mike Ashton a couple of weeks ago, the CPI expert. And I asked him straight out, you know, could we see the CPI go negative? And he kind of, uh, kind of, like, and he was being respectful, kind of, you know, chuckled a little bit. So, well, the only way that's going to happen is housing prices would have to crash. And he said, I don't think that happens. I said, well, I think they're going to. I, I, I see all these people moving out of the big cities. And we haven't seen the banks really foreclose or really pressure the the, the tenants or, or the owners on that side. But I think you know, people like my client, if, if he can't get that rent, yeah, I mean, what happens when the defaults it? Or if I'm a homeowner, right? And I've, and I've been in forbearance or just making a payment, just to keep the bank off my back. Yeah. What, what happens when, when all this money runs out? And I think that's what people don't realize is, is still to come. I think it's very likely. You know, the thing that, the thing that's a little weird here is it's different from the last housing event. Like it's structurally different. And, and because it doesn't look the same, I think um, it's getting overly discounted. So in the last, uh, the last housing crash was a speculative crash. Like, you know, you talk to, I talked to people who were like, yeah, I, I bought a house and I bought another house. And I levered this one against this one. You know, they, were, they had like four houses which is just crazy. <laughs> and, you know, people who are, who are fairly overextended on it, like, it's not like they, they owned them free and clear. Um, mm-hmm. And so those, those speculative corrections after a, after a speculative frenzy tend to be quick because it all kind of unwinds at once. And that stuff was, you know, collateralized against itself and whatever else. But I think what we're seeing here is a little bit different. You could start to see people go insolvent, be forced to sell their assets and just the slow, gradual creep up in supply in the markets which leads to a more grindy, long-term erosion of housing prices because you know that inventory starts to build up after a while um, as people go more and more insolvent. Because the insolvency stuff is not, it's not as exciting as the liquidity event, right? Not that it's good, but it's, you know, a liquidity event is this like shock and awe drop in the markets. Everyone's paying attention to it. And I think it's it's harder to watch a solvency event play out especially when we're all used to like fast twitch media, fast twitch, um, you know, data streams. I, I think that what we'll see is that it is a, a longer, grindier process here. And especially if you, um, you know, if you think about the, the way that um, the way that the CPI looks right now is really interesting. I mean, the service sector has been destroyed. Right? Everybody knows that you can just look outside. Um, but some of that spend that people had, got transferred over into buying stuff, you know, like the exercise bike, that is basically a pull forward of demand. And now that demand is vacant in the future. And that's probably the next, I don't know, a year or two, right? Before we restore that demand. And so if the CPI uh, service side component doesn't recover, which, I, you know, it will eventually, Americans are pretty resourceful, but I don't think it's going to bounce back super fast. Starting a restaurant, which I've helped do is, it's hard. Like it takes a while and it takes some capital investment. And so as those services business starts to sort of bring themselves back online slowly, and you have this little well of demand in the future that you've already spent, I think what you could see is just a thinning across a lot of elements in the CPI, including housing. And, you know, I think that's an accurate read that we would need to see that for a proper negative CPI. But I don't think it's just going to come out of nowhere with like a big scary CPI print, I think it'll be just this grind downward. And at some point, that'll probably scare the markets. Who knows when? <laughs> well, yeah. And, and I think there's another factor from the demand side is that people really aren't talking about. I see this from my own clients is some people were, were almost forced into retirement. Some of them, yeah. Yeah, their health is already bad. And their, their spouse has said, look, if you if you get this thing, it, it might actually kill you. So they they retired early, and other people are being you know, pushed out. You know, companies are laying off. We saw a nine a nine hundred thousand unemployment hit today. I, I think that's a factor that a lot of people don't realize is there are some wealthy retirees, a lot who aren't. You yeah. know, the, the average four hundred one k values were like one hundred fifty thousand. I mean, that's not going to bring a lot of demand. Yeah, and you know, as you're well aware, I mean, you help people plan for retirement, and planning for retirement is the process of creating 
a pretty stable and relatively strict budget. So you're, you're effectively creating the boundaries of your demand and you are removing the sort of psychological speculative side of demand. I mean, when you're in the market and you're, you know, you're in your prime earning years, you're willing to take risks for things you want because you figure I'm going to be working for another 10, 20 years, right? And, and if I get a little bit overextended here, it's fine. So people are, that demand side is a little more flexible when you're working. Now, when you retire, you start planning for a very fixed um, budget for the rest of your life. A lot of that speculative buying goes out the window. And so if, if we've got a big wave of people forced into early retirement, I think that will definitely apply demand pressure. Um, and, and, you know, the other, the other interesting component there is it could also see uh, some, uh, some equity market implications. If people are rolling out of equities, putting it into safer stuff like bonds, you know, less volatile stuff, I, I think that that could affect asset prices eventually. Yeah, and RMDs are coming back this year too. So a lot of people may not realize they were suspended last year and, and they're back. And that, you know, that's just going to force people to draw off of their uh, retirement accounts. So uh, you know, I, I don't want to end on the CPI thing just yet because we haven't talked about the relationship between that and the dollar. And I think you and I are in the same camp that, uh, and I refer to the dollar as the pin on the grenade. You know, when this thing gets pulled and the dollar takes yeah. off, people are going to go screaming out. You know, do you yeah. think that could really be a deflationary pulse if the dollar screams out? And, and do you think it's going to? I do. There's some really interesting positioning around the dollar. Um, people are pretty short the dollar. It's kind of a favorite reflation trade. That's part of the reason I like the trade. It's because if it were to go down a little bit more, you get a little bit of support from people, you know, cashing in on these shorts. So I think that there's potential for, for the dollar to really rip. Um, and I think that we'll only see that once people uh, start needing to service these dollar debts. Um, you know, the, it's not just about America. I think, I think in America, as Americans, we're really tempted to think about the dollar issues and the Fed and monetary policy as an America-centric thing. But there is a lot of need for dollars overseas as well. You know, commodities are, are transacted in dollars. There's a lot of dollar debt floating out there in the world. And, and typically, as you've pointed out, um, the transmission mechanism for dollars, if you create a bunch more dollars in the US, the transmission mechanism is effectively the American consumer. And it's the American consumer directly buying overseas goods. It's the American consumer buying American assembled goods for which the raw materials are sourced elsewhere. You know, without that demand engine, you start to get some real awkward stuff happening on the global stage, right? People, people just like the individual consumer, these corporations have dollar denominated debt. And if that starts to backslide, then it has a recursive loop potential because their goods are worth a little bit less. They need to sell more and more of them. And you invert this supply demand thing where now all of a sudden they're trying to flood the markets with supply of whatever it is, copper or you know, any of these things have been ripping lately. They start to flood the markets with supply because they need to sell more to get the dollars they need to service the debt. So I think there's potential for that to back up pretty hard. Yeah, and, and that's interesting that you may have mentioned that the U.S. consumer is a driver of getting those dollars overseas. You also think travel, right? I mean, we get yeah. on a, a plane, fly to Europe or, or Asia and spend money. And you look at what quantitative easing is doing. It's trying to actually fill that hole. And it, it's, yeah. it doesn't, it can't, it, it, it does such a poor job. And that's where we get kind of that bucket analogy that, you know, Brent Johnson has kind of made popular and other people where you see the water coming out because of all the holes. Well, what's wrong with the system? Dollars aren't getting where they need to be. And, you know, I kind of thought that China and other countries really hold all the cards here because they have an option to devalue against the dollar. But, you know, with, with President Trump in office and me, I don't know if he was the X factor that they were, you know, felt like, hey, this guy will retaliate. Um, but to me, it seems like there could be a currency devaluation going on pretty soon. And then we heard from, I don't know if you heard this out of the Eurozone, I think it was either yesterday or maybe this morning, that they're, they're, they're evaluating, you know, where, where they're at on their currency relative to the dollar. And it tells me like, man, a dollar deval would be really interesting right now. Or I mean, a, 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 a deval against the dollar. Yeah, it would. You know, these the, these countries need to stay competitive, and and one of the ways to be more competitive is to increase the purchasing power of Americans, like to lure them back to your goods. And if you can do that by by tweaking your currency, you know, if you if you devalue against the dollar, that means that every American who's thinking about buying a thing that they can't quite afford, 
now they can. So you can stoke this demand fire um, if you're a foreign central bank that needs to you know, get your own economy rolling by juicing the appetite of American consumers. And they have the levers to do that. So it wouldn't surprise me if we started to see these um, intentional devaluations, um, which is why you know, you'd pointed out the M2. I, I think people over-index on some of these, these creation mechanisms. Like they're, they're simplistic metrics. So you know, if you imagine you have a, a patient who needs a blood transfusion, right? You're like, oh man, they need three liters of blood. Like they're really, they're in a hard situation here. And the doctor goes to the blood fridge, gets the blood, sets it on the table next to the patient. And you measure like the amount of blood around the patient. You're like, damn, that's a lot of blood. They're going to have too much blood. That's sort of what I think about with this, this monetary policy stuff. Like the transmission mechanism matters. The way that that stuff enters the economy, the way that it starts sloshing around in the economy. I mean, that that's really where uh, things get interesting. You know, and when we think about uh, some of the policies that are being kicked around, you know, in the new administration from an infrastructure standpoint, it, I, I think that inflation is going to be a, a very subtle beast here for a while. Because if the government rolls in and decides, you know, we want to do a big renewable wave and, and we're going to drop large solar farms in, in every town in America, then yes, I think you're going to see some inflationary effects in materials that are specific to that infrastructure wave. But they are a ways away from doing that. They, the, America is very polarized. It's going to be an oppositional process. And so if I were looking to, to make some plays around inflation, I wouldn't be thinking about the M2 as much as I would be thinking about how is that money going to flow into the system and, and when will we know where it's going? Yeah, and, and that's a great point. And I'm glad you brought up you know, get, getting some of these uh, bills passed through Congress, because I think that's the issue. A lot of people are, you know, they just assume, OK, we've got all Democrats. It's going to be inflationary. They're going to they're going to tax and spend. And, and I look back four years ago and say, well, wait a minute. When we had all Republicans, it was like, oh, pro-business, that was going to be inflationary. And so I started, you know, I'm getting back to our like, how does this machine work? You, know, you start looking back and say, well, the majority right now is pretty thin and it's only 50 50 in the Senate. To me, that's really where the rubber meets the road. I'm not convinced that they're going to be able to get stuff passed through. I know they can do a reconciliation. And, and for those who aren't familiar with that is it's, it's a simple majority, but it's, it's like it expels a lot of political capital to get those kind of bills through. And, and you get, they can do two this year um, and it could take months. I don't think the consumers can wait that long. And I'm not solely convinced that this, this, the Republicans are going to, at least in the past, the problem has said no to Obama, no to Clinton. We're, we're not passing these big fiscal stimulus packages. What, what do you think? Is, is that, do you think Republicans are going to jump on board now or do you think they're going to say no? I think there's a couple interesting components there. One, as you point out, you know, they are going to, they are going to push a bunch of economic policy stuff on a lot of fronts, but only some of it will get through. And we're not sure which ones yet. Um, so it, it could be a big infrastructure bill. You know, they're kicking around some, not to go too deep on the topic, but some of the like stable coin legislation stuff. Like I think a few of those will get through and they will make a big market impact, but we just don't know which ones yet. And it, the other thing that's an interesting dynamic of the incoming administration, I mean, we're, you know, 24 hours into it or whatever, but they appear to want to take a really um, unifying approach. You know, the theme of, of Biden's first few speeches is, is all about bringing people together. And so that feeds back into the amount of political capital that they're going to want to use in a ride roughshod over the Republicans kind of way. I don't think there's a ton of appetite for that right now. I think Americans are just kind of like tired of fighting each other a little bit, you know? And so if we can, I, I think there, I think there's a limited amount that they can ram through. And I think that that's decreased by the overall desire to, to be a little bit more consensus driven over the, in, especially the first couple of years. Now, as that stuff kicks into high gear, I think a couple of years out, we could see some, some more, um, you know, DNC style policy come in. And that's, that style of policy does tend to be a little bit more promotional to, of, um, of what people classically think of inflation, right? Like infrastructure spending drives up materials costs. And, and that's how people think of inflation is like the stuff that I buy every day. So I think that that could come. I just don't think we're there yet. And I think that what happens between here and there is this slow kind of 
grind downward until we until we get clarity around what the policy output of this administration will be. Yeah, and that's interesting because we look back to Obama's infrastructure uh, bill. It wasn't inf- it was billed as no. highly inflation? Was it? Wasn't it? At it all. wasn't. And I and I think people are looking at all this saying like they they're hopeful because they they need inflation to come back because they need jobs to come back because as yeah. you kind of mentioned, and my heart really goes out to a lot of these you know, restaurant tours because totally. you know, family businesses are going to fail, and and as you know as a, a business owner and I know and you don't just go start a business tomorrow. Yeah. And, you know, you're immediately profitable. It's going to be really hard to go down this path. And and so I look at Congress now and I look at the Republicans and, yeah, they, they didn't lose as bad as everyone thought. And and we know when there's a majority in two years, that majority ends. And I think the Republicans know that. And, and my hunch is they're going to become really fiscal conservative really quick and try to let the American public know they don't run the show. We still do put us back in power in two years. And and I, I don't think uh, uh, the Biden administration is going to push through a lot of this legislation very quickly. And that's going to what is going to turn us into that next insolvency event. Yeah, I think there's a window toward the end of 2022 where the Democrats may come in riding really hard to get a bunch of stuff through right before the election. And so that that window, you know, you figure 2022, some of that spending happens, plays out. You could see a little inflation pulse around 2023. There's also some demographic stuff there, like all of the millennials will be in the workforce then, you know, insofar as they can be. <laughs> the generation got a little beaten down. But there will be, there will be, um, a little bit of demographic pressure around that time. I think that's an interesting window to look for a little bit of inflation, but I just remain convinced that the amount of debt that we've got as a society, until we pay that down, the capacity for the capacity for us to generate proper inflation, I'm not sure I'm a believer. Yeah, it's kind of interesting you say that because a lot of people say like they'll they'll message me and say, okay, don't you think that all the spending is going to be inflationary? I'm like, so since when in the last 40 years has borrowed more money turned out to be anything but disinflationary? And with the CPI at relatively low numbers, I mean, it's hard not to think that it can't hit zero like some of these other countries, which brings me to a point I, I, I know you've been wanting me to ask you is, I know you're really bullish on bonds, and this is going to shock people because here you are, <laughs> ex software guy. They would think that you know, and you're and you're relatively young, that you would have this massive portfolio just overloaded with tech stocks, but you're a bond bull. Yeah. yeah. How, how could how is that possible, Travis? <laughs> well, sadly, at the moment, I don't have a massive portfolio of tech stocks because those have been doing all right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But um, I kind of like the slower more gravity driven plays. Like I, I sort of think of macro as the study of gravitational forces in economics, you know, like you're looking for things that are structural imbalances that kind of have to play out and you can get into them whenever, you know, whenever you see an opportunity and then wait for that stuff to play out. Um, and one of the things that, that I, I got really infatuated with was studying bonds because they're much more complex than people think. Like people, you know, the 60, 40 portfolio, I think the way people think of it is you've got the equities component, which is very diverse, right? Like there's all these companies you can do. You can become a value investor, read PLs, do research on them, pick sectors. And then there's sort of like bonds, which are just one thing. And that's not really, that's that's not really my read on it. I think bonds are also this very rich universe of, of assets. You know, yes, you've got different kinds of bonds and all that, but just the yield curve alone is a is a fascinating artifact. You know, you're you're basically looking at the, it's the best way to keep the pulse on the money supply over time, in my view, because you're if you're if you're a large company and you have, you know, I don't know, you've got hundred million dollars worth of capital on your balance sheet, and you don't need that, um, you can, from a planning perspective, think about when you will need it, allocate it into bonds, and what you're seeing there when the entire world is doing this, and sort of foreshadowing when they think they'll need capital. Your the, the the yield curve ends up containing a lot of that signal, right? And so when that's it's part of why when you see a yield curve inversion, what you're seeing there is there's a little thin spot out in the future where there's not going to be enough money, and that's why it helps predict recessions. Is it's able to say, well, yes, there's enough now money, but relative to the now money, there's a thin spot where there's really not enough of a certain type of money, and then we go back into having more money. 
And when we get to that position, there's the potential for a liquidity event. And, and so I think part of what's interesting about the, the yield curve and bonds generally is that it, it's, it's just such a complex topic that um, you can sit there and learn about it for days. So I love thinking about bond positions in terms of where do I want to be in duration? Like assume you're going to have a bond position forever and you're just going to walk back and forth across the curve. That's a super interesting thought experiment, right? Like dollars are, are zero duration money. And so you have cash out to very, very long-term debt. Um, I mean, I'm preaching to the choir here. You're the bond king. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm sure Jeffrey Gunlock might disagree with that, but I haven't <laughs> talked to him yet, so we'll see. But one thing you just mentioned was duration. And yeah. so I, I'm just kind of curious, is you when you first looked at bonds, and because the most common thing that I people ask me is, how can you be invested in bonds? All you're getting is the interest. And I kind of chuckle and I say, I'll send them an email, go to investopedia.com and look up duration. And then I usually get an email back about an hour later, like, oh, so... So did you have that kind of like wow moment when you you know when you first started understanding what duration and how that works across the curve? I mean, did that change your perspective? I did, and it was initially triggered by um, at one point having muni bonds, which are you know for American investors they're nice. You get sort of tax advantage stuff, and then I, I was watching the base value of those change relatively quickly at one point, and thought, what is going on here? And so you know if you if you get into the math of what happens with a bond. Um, as those expectations about the future change, you're able to capture the value of those expectations now. That's effectively what's going on, by by my understanding. So, you know, if the if, if the 30 year bond moves like one percent, that is massive capital appreciation or loss, depending on which way it moves, um, because you're able to capture those 30 year out expectations about money today. And that is what is so fascinating about bonds. I mean, I think people view them as, as this really mild instrument, and they generally tend to be. Like you look at what's happened with something like TLT recently, it's just sort of bouncing around. Even, even if you got in there wrong and are, are still holding it, you're not, it's not moving around that much until all of a sudden there's a huge, meaningful repricing of forward expectations around, around the need for money. And then they can rip out of nowhere, like 20, 30% in a couple of weeks. Yeah. And, and what's kind of interesting is you look at last year. So 2021, nobody liked bonds. If you look at what the S and P 500 did, which was a little, just touch over 18% and you, and you just, let's say you had 30 year bonds, you beat the market and you think about not only did you beat it, but the risk you took was yeah. Pff, yeah. nothing. And so if, if we're looking at uh, the 30 year, somewhere between, you know, one eight and one nine uh, right now, hopefully it's gone down since we started talking on <laughs> <in> our interview. <laughs> uh, you know, you, you have a potential if the 30 year can get somewhere near zero of a 30 to 40% price return. And again, the risk is negligible at that level. And then from a macro perspective, because I know you're, you're a more longer term two to five year macro guy. Tell me about the setup that that puts you in if bond prices are sitting that high. Where, where, is it, where are risk assets going to be now? Oh, from this height? I mean, <laughs> I hesitate to even guess. You know, it's, it's getting pretty, we're up into the nosebleed heights of, you know, equity valuations here. To touch on a couple of points there. One, the great thing about bonds and specifically treasury bonds is that there is no solvency risk. Mm. Now, I know that inflationists can come back and push back on that and talk about purchasing power and all that. But and and you know, I, I think there's something to be unpacked there. But you're you're not gonna lose all your money. Like the the United States government is not going to default on its debt because they there's no reason for them to, right? It's just it's almost a structural impossibility of the system. Could you lose a little bit of purchasing power? Yes, that's all that yield curve stuff we were just talking about. Um, but but it's a it, it, in some senses, it's a riskless asset, which is wild to have that. Um, and then the upside comes from situations like right now. Everybody has bought into this reflation trade, right? I mean, you look at positioning, everyone believes some form of inflation is coming as a result of you know, the, the money printer meme. Um, if they're wrong, there's a tendency to start to realize that all at once. <laughs> We saw that back in March, right? People started looking around and saying, oh my gosh, people are going to need a lot more money in the future than we thought they would. Um, 
So I think one of the exciting things about it from a positioning perspective is that the downside is, I mean, it's relatively marginal. You can sit there and just wait for it to happen. And that's what I, that's the kind of trade that I like is where, you know, I think given the amount of economic damage, it's sort of inevitable that at some point we will all collectively realize fiat is not dead. And bonds are a really good way to express that because you can park in them, get a little bit of a yield, which isn't really the point, but you can get a little bit of a yield along the way and wait for that realization to happen. Now, one of my flaws as an investor is that I tend to like thinking farther out into the future than the market does, which means you know, I missed out on all the equity stuff, tried to short it a couple of times, totally failed. Um, and so I tend to, I, I, I like looking for these, these structural inevitability trades that have very limited downside, either from a positioning perspective or, or, or from a you know, solvency perspective, ideally both, and then just getting into those and waiting. And it, it, it reduces it down to just a waiting game. If you truly believe it's an inevitability, which I do, I'm sure people will laugh at me for, but hey, mm -hmm. that's my read. If you believe that, it doesn't really matter what happens to the price. You're just waiting for an event. And that's sort of how I view the trade. Would you agree with that? Yeah, 100%. I, I think people don't really understand you know, what bonds are. They're just deferred dollars, kind of as you mentioned. And you, you look at the setup here, which I really find interesting is so many people think, okay, QE, you know, interest rates go up, bond prices go down. And, you know, I've done a lot of the research on this where you look at the Fed is buying 10 and a half billion of 30 year treasury bonds specifically yeah. every month as part of their broad, uh, broad purchase program, which I think they'll do more in the next you know, increase that they do. And if you look at what the primary dealers are taking in auction, it's been around five billion dollars a month. So we'll assume that 100% of that eventually gets flipped to the Fed. Well, if the Fed's buying 10 and a half billion, well, where's the other five and a half coming from? Well, yeah. that means the dealers have to go out to the open market and reduce the supply of bonds. Well, I have a little trouble understanding why people think a supply reduction leads to lower prices. But I look at this as I'm just betting on the Fed. And I think the Fed's been right in the past. They'll be yep. right again. I don't have any risks of the position because I'm not short. And eventually QE will overwhelm all the sellers. And then you'll have this massive unwind because the market, like you said, not positioned for a bond rally. And if bonds go up, well, there's your dollar milkshake theory kicks in, you know, and we all become dollar milkshakers because you have that zero duration bond go up. And the advantage when you're on the long wave macro now is your time is terrible at the top. It, it, you just assume yeah. you're going to be wrong and wrong for years. Yeah. But that bottom, you're going to look like a supreme genius yeah. when you bottom tick that thing by selling your bonds. And that's where you make all your money is buying low, not chasing it to the top. Yeah, exactly. I mean, bonds are basically a way to ensure that you've got capital when stuff's cheap, which is awesome. It's, you know, you park capital. They, they tend to do well when things get cheap and, and you know, it makes them sort of the greatest trade ever. Yeah. As long, as long as you're not like an equity holder or, and I don't want to pick on the Bitcoin people. Cause I know, you know, you hear them as holders, you know, equity people don't sell at the top bond people do. Then there's a huge difference there because one of the things, and I know we want to talk about this uh, is correlations. You know, you hear a lot about people saying, okay, well, you're dumb for owning bonds because you know, you got to be an inflation asset. And so I always ask, well, what would I be in? Oh, you got to be in like gold mine stocks. And my usual <laughs> yeah. answer is, have you ever charted the two next to each other? I'll, I'll, totally. I'm going to throw that right over to you. <laughs> yeah. Yes. So there are, there's definitely a crew on Twitter that thinks that, um, you know, rates are going to rise, therefore own gold. Um, and that is not, that has not historically been the correct play. So let's first start with gold, right? You know, there's uh, currently, I think gold prices is, is driven by at least a narrative that um, real rates are what influence the price of gold. And so if tomorrow we woke up, God forbid, and the 30 year was at 3%, you would expect gold to take the most epic nosedive ever. And likewise, if, if inflation expectations and or CPI, some combination of that, something that was in influencing the perception of inflation, um, went down for any reason. Could be this, you know, solvency stuff. Could be whatever. Um, again, gold kind of dumps, and and then 
when you when you start getting into minors, there are more subtle things that come into play, right? So if you there is a study that I um, ran across the other day showing that if you're truly an inflation bull, gold isn't the best expression. It's more raw materials, right? Raw materials tend to do a little better if you know it's inflation. You go with raw materials, not gold. Um, gold has other sort of more specific purposes. So then think about that. In an inflation environment, raw materials go up and, and gold could go a number of ways depending on real rates. But what happens if you're holding miners and raw materials, which include energy prices, go up? All of a sudden, you have serious margin compression on those miners, right? And, and if real rates turn against you at the same time, I mean, those could be those could go from being very profitable entities to not so profitable entities pretty quickly, even if the gold price is mild, just because the inputs to their business model start to get expensive. You're absolutely right on. And I think where the opportunity is, when you talk about the greatest trade, I've actually, I'm going to have to steal that from you if you don't mind, uh, because <laughs> my whole macro thesis has been, we're going to see a replay of the great financial crisis because the yeah. Fed's going to do the one thing that they think everyone thinks works, which is more QE. Yeah. And that's what what's going to drive the CPI negative. Now, when that happens, we know, as we just talked about, now you've got bonds at all time high. I'm not I'm not a holder. You know, there's, there's yeah. no way I'm not in it for the coupon. I'm in it for uh, the price appreciation. But there's but normally what you see, if you if you took like TLT and GDX and you chart them, I mean, the correlations pretty strong, except during insolvency events. And they all completely reverse of each other. And so I look at this as there's going to be a huge opportunity to come back in one of the fastest moving sectors at the bottom, which will be gold miners, uh, you know, potentially emerging markets, your tips, your highly inflation sensitive assets. But it's not a long term play. You know, it's two to three years until, like you said, the economy recovers and inflation starts to get back. But by that point, if you go back to 2008 and if you would have done that flip from bonds into gold miners, you would have made uh, like a 300 percent return in a matter totally. of a couple of years. I mean, this is what people don't realize about macro is you, you can be wrong for a certain period of time. But when you're on it, it's it's literally like being in Vegas. You pull a thing, the lights go off on the slot machine. Then you pull it again and they go off again. And you're like, yeah. 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 But you know, at some point, you're just feeding coins and losing, but you made so much money, you don't care. Yeah. Yeah. I think that, you know, I think that's gold and bonds tend to move in unison until suddenly for a brief period of time, they don't. And it's that moment we were talking about when, you know, the bond bull markets are usually, what are they, like three weeks? <laughs> the yeah. yeah they're, they're really, really short. <laughs> so, and during those rippers, gold doesn't do great. So if you're holding mm -hmm. bonds, it's an awesome trade, right? You sell the bonds, buy the gold. And then typically after that, you do see gold recover. And so when people think about like gold from a very long view perspective, you know, I, I am a gold bull from that perspective. I think gold does great, uh, yeah. you know, slowly, gradually over time. That's sort of its job. But you do see these dislocation pockets. And that's really where a lot of the opportunity lies. Yeah. And I don't think a lot of investors realize that, that, you know, and, and I, I said this, I've said this before to people that were heavily in gold mine or gold. It's like, you ought to have a little bit of a bond hedge if nothing else. And they think, God, oh, you're crazy. I'm like, you don't understand. You're not really giving, you're giving away a little upside because if the two just go together, they go together. But if I'm right and this plays out, Ooh, you're, you're, you're going to wish you had some capital to buy low. And as you mentioned before, this is a real speculative market. I don't think people have, money on the sidelines, if no. this thing unwinds 30, 40, 50%, I, I don't think they've got it. No, if you look at the funds, uh, I saw some stuff pop up the other day. If you look at uh, cash levels, they're really low. I mean, there's just not a lot of cash out there, which you know increases risk. Yeah. And then you start looking at people having to make these tough decisions about, okay, I, you know, my, my landlord is saying, I got I to gotta start paying this and I got to feed the kids. And something you and I've talked about is, you know, you have these assets like gold and you have cryptocurrencies. There is that moment, you know, where, you know, the husband and wife sit down at the table and they're looking at each other and they look at their bills and look at the bank yeah. account and the, the two aren't adding up at all. Yeah, and, totally. and they're like, okay, we need to get some money. Yeah. We're, well, we don't want to cash out the 401k because we don't want right. to pay penalties and taxes. So what do you do next? Right. She says, oh, didn't you buy some of the, that that bit, whatever, you know, a <laughs> <Yeah>. year ago? <laughs> <laughs> and, and next thing you know, you've got people forced to sell stuff that they don't want to sell. And maybe we're seeing yes. that a little, you think we're seeing some of that now that we're in the first of the year with Bitcoin kind of going down? Do you see that? Or you know, do you think Bit that? 
Bitcoin's so volatile, it's hard to say. Like, you got to see it really play out a few times. I mean, a 10% move in Bitcoin, which we had today, is just an ordinary day for Bitcoin. <laughs> you know? It goes, you have three or four days where it goes up 5% and then it dumps 10%. So I think it's early to call that, but the potential is sitting out there. And at some point, I do believe it will happen. And, you know, it's something that I've been through. Like I've, I've been insolvent and I had to sell stuff, you know, or the, the entrepreneurial days, especially, they just sort of force insolvency upon you. <laughs> so you get to experience the glory of not having anything and then having less than nothing for a while. But, you know, I, I had Bitcoin at one point. I tell the story, I've told the story a couple of times. I bought like 10 bucks worth of Bitcoin, it was 10 cents. And then at one point it was $300. And that was the time when I was an entrepreneur and I sold it, not because, I, I thought the price was going to go down. It had nothing to do with my expectations around price at all. I just sold it because the money was way more valuable at that point in time than any potential for future gains. Like the, the potential for future gains was just this far away secondary consideration. I just needed the money. So I think we, I think that's going to be the thing that drives assets lower. It is, is not people thinking that they're, you know, people thinking that it's too high or people thinking that it won't go higher. I don't think that that's what does it. I think it's need. And I think it's a, a demand for a, per, a very personal demand to have cash right now to, to live your life. And that is probably what tips this over, I think. Who's, who's to say when, but. Well, it, it maybe we're seeing it, starting to see it, maybe not just with Bitcoin, but maybe my, my client who's, you know, calling his, his renters and saying, look, you, you got to start paying. And, right. and they start grumbling. I don't have any money. It's like, well, then you need to pack your bags because as you mentioned, there's, there's not a lot of cash on the sideline. The M2, I think is more corporate uh, bank accounts than I think it is uh, consumer accounts. And you've kind of set up the storm where people are going to be forced to sell things they don't want to sell. And, and then you and there isn't enough fiscal or and Congress doesn't have enough time to get something through to to save everybody. There is a that's point right. where the music stops. Yeah, I mean that to me that's the, the central question for me in macro right now is when will people have to start selling things that they still believe in? That is how I'm thinking about the next phase because at some point people will still believe in the things they're holding. You know, people's beliefs change pretty slowly, and, and and we all have a tendency to just commit, you know, and then yeah. and then stubbornly sit in a trade. But at what point do people start selling things? Not because their minds have changed about anything, not because some data point that came out, not because the narrative broke down, but just because they need money. That's probably the biggest question I'm asking myself right now. Yeah, because if you knew that. Yeah. And you know, based on your college degree, we could we we could go to you and say you, you, maybe you could help us with this. Uh, but if you knew that when that day or weekish was going to start to happen, that would be the day you could short the market and make a fortune because you knew now you know that hey the the risk there is, is kind yeah. of over. But again, you come back to bonds. Yeah. It's a waiting game, right? It's, right. It's, it's the only way you can take that that same view with, with without getting hammered on uh, being short on the way up. That's right. Yeah, I've tried that being short on the way up. I don't recommend it. <laughs> no. So I want to hit on a, a little, maybe a little controversial topic that you and I uh, chatted about yesterday. I'm a little bit older than you. And so I grew up with, well, we'll just, I'm going to call him Trump because that's how I grew up. I never, I didn't grow up with calling him the president or ex president. He just, he's Trump. So yeah. he started gaining his notoriety, notoriety in the, well, I got that wrong, in the <laughs> 80s. So you're a little bit younger. So you kind of grew up with him being this, you know, celebrity, this billionaire. And now that he's not the president anymore, people are going to have this perception that he's just going to disappear. And if you follow kind of his rise to power, uh, one, you know, he doesn't quit. Number two, yeah. he really likes it when people slam him on the ground and kick him in the face because he loves a good fight. I don't think this guy's done with. Now, I don't mean that he may not run for president again, but I think he has the power to really influence things and be a wrecking ball for the Democrats. What, what do you think about that? I think he could. Um, you know, in gaming that stuff out, it, we're in a really interesting time here. You know, Trump is Trump is a uh, polarity responder. There's this psychology 
trope that people talk about polarity responders where, you know, you come in and you tell someone they have to do something and they just fight tooth and nail against you. It's like, you know, it's just basic oppositionalism for no reason other than a reflex. And as a, I have some of that, you know, people poke me about crypto online and I instantly decided to dig into the other side of it just because I was poked. (laughs) And I think Trump has that um, character trait. So the fact that the entire world decided that, you know, that from their view, he had done some questionable things and they were going to mute him. I think that makes him want to be louder. Like, I think that's the natural Trumpian response just as a guy. Um, So, you know, he's got a fair amount of resources ostensibly. So I think if he wants to figure out how to make problems, he's going to figure out how to make problems. I don't quite know how to price that yet. Um, You know, I think we're going to have to see who listens to him and and whether or not he still has the ability to affect markets. Um, But, but, I certainly would not count the guy out as a presence in the, in the world. You know, and that's interesting. You said his effect on the markets, because that's exactly where I was going with it. Here, here's probably the first person I've literally ever seen that could speak and move algos to bid markets one direction or the other. I mean, and, and there are still days I'm, I'm like, man, I still can't believe that one man can have that much power and he knows it. And how hard would it be for a man of his resources, even if he's told no by everybody, to yeah. get a microphone or a camera in front of him and talk the markets down. I think that is a real possibility. You know, he, he's not happy and um, he is probably one of the best figures at, at controlling narrative that I've seen. Again, independent of whatever your political views are on the guy, he sure can meme. <laughs> you know, I mean, he's like, he's one of these meme lords. Like he can just, he he's, He's got everything from the, um, you know, make America great again is an interesting slogan the first time you hear it. But what he's able to do is go into a big crowd, test balloon these narratives and just see which ones catch. And in a very, in a, in a fairly mercenary fashion, pick the one that catches and run with it. And that is a, that's a powerful skill set. And uh, we, we're going to have to see how he chooses to deploy it. Yeah, it certainly, it certainly will be interesting because if he holds that power, I think you and I both know one he's going to test it to see it. Yep. And then he's going to and he's going to hammer it into the ground so hard because that's his way to get even. And he's not yep. a guy that goes away easily. Even though I'm sure people are going to try to try to keep him muted as long as possible. That's just like you said. That's not the Trumpian response at all. Yeah, it's not. And I, you know, I think we, I think that another interesting thing to keep an eye on is. Uh, a lookout for those test balloons. You know, keep an eye on him. What's he trying? Is it taking? Because I think there's probably um, some potential to front run a narrative if you see one taking shape. Yeah, it, it'll certainly be interesting as we kind of. Uh, what I'm going to now wrap up the interview is called the greatest trade, right? So we've gone we've gone from bonds, gold mining, inflation sensitive sector. Then then what's the last part? You know, if we look out two to five years, which is what your window is. Uh, the, the first two fit in there, but I've got a couple years at the end. Where, where does the greatest trade end uh, in your view? Uh, what, what's the last sector you'd be in? So I'm, I'm very in line with, I think, your and Raul's thinking on this. I think that the, you know, this, this decade at some point will be a great time to own commodities, some of that commodity trend following stuff that, that you know, the uh, allegory of the hawk and the serpent paper that was passed around. Oh, Chris Cole. Yeah, Chris yeah. Cole. Uh, great, great article. Definitely worth a read. But um, he, in it, he mentions commodity trend following. I think that could be a really interesting strategy for this decade at some point after this stuff sort of you know rolls over and then evens out or whatever. On the back half of that, I would love to get into some commodity trend following. Um, I think emerging markets are very, it's a very similar trade. Uh, and then, you know, foreign, foreign stuff, non-US stuff. Like the US has just had this epic decade huge ripper right and typically what happens after that is you want to look other places there's there's interesting um bond markets overseas that still have you know pretty juicy yields that that have the potential to get compressed down so i would be i'd be looking overseas toward the end of that yeah and and, and i I agree with a lot of those views and one i'll I'll add in our our mutual friend brent johnson i mean you you can't be kind of a long-term macro person without being a dollar milkshaker i think it just comes with the turf (laughs) that you know if 
we start seeing currency devals and those yeah. don't work. Well, his, his view is, well, you'll see foreign central banks who can print money. And totally. I, I want to make that distinction between what the Fed is doing and using that money to buy U.S. equities. So you could have, you know, a, a potential view of, you know, long U.S. equities and commodities. And that would be certainly interesting. And, but, you know, First, we got to see this first part play out, and then maybe we can come you know, and talk about uh, how we see the rest of it playing out. But I, I really had a great time, Travis. I enjoyed talking to you. And uh, for those who don't know you're on Twitter, uh, how can they follow along with your research and your comments uh, on a regular basis? I, I would call it more general troublemaking, but you can find me. At, <laughs> my handle is Colorado Travis. Um, I'm on there pretty frequently. I have a lot of fun. I always enjoy talking with everyone. You know, there's... There's no one with a follower count too too low for me to engage with. I mean, I got on there like this year and some of the most insightful comments that I've seen on there are people with an account that's, you know, three months old and are just showing up to share some of their research. So I would encourage everyone to get on Twitter. Um, it's a really, really interesting platform. Yeah, it, it's a great platform. And uh, we'll, so we'll look forward to seeing more of you there, more, more interviews, hopefully with you on Real Vision. And then, of course, all these cool things that you've got. Uh, laid out for the platform. Again, thanks for taking the time to talk with me today. Always a pleasure. Long live the Bond Kingdom. <laughs> I'm Stephen Van Meter on the half on behalf of the entire Real Vision production team. Uh, thank you for watching, and we'll look forward to seeing you again soon. I hope you enjoyed this special episode of the interview, the premier business and finance series in the world. However, this is just the tip of the iceberg. For more in-depth content and expert analysis. Visit the membership link in the description to unlock a week's access for only $1. This dollar can change your life.